In this lesson, we're going to talk about files and exactly what a file is and what a compromise is and how to access those files using paths. In this submodule, we're going to specifically learn about what and where and how files are made. Next up, we're going to learn about file paths, some line endings and why they're really important, and also character encodings that are used for the files. So what exactly is a file? If you remember back in module one, we talked about the basic components of what a computer is. We had a CPU and the processing unit that kind of resided there. Um, we had main memory, which communicated directly with the CPU and sent back and forth ones and zeros as the data. And the CPU would crunch those numbers and then spit them back out. And that's how we kind of operated with things. Well, a file is actually located on secondary memory. And the reason why is we needed some we need something that is persistent, uh, meaning that it, it doesn't get lost when the program is is done executing or even beyond uh, power cycles. So if we look at our, our little uh, diagram here, you can see you, you know I've got a, a, my computer uh, kind of architecture here, and in our processing unit we have the CPU and the main memory which kind of sits on that, and and that's your directly accessed and memory that's on there. Now, your I.O. devices is kind of all the things that interact with, with the processing unit. And we're talking specifically about our secondary memory. And I've got a bunch of little files on here, right, that gets translated over here. So those, those files are translated into ones and zeros and throw, loaded up into memory. And then memory is throwing that back into the CPU. The CPU does some processing. It gets thrown back into the main memory. And eventually... If that's what we desire, we push that changes onto secondary memory. So that's like a save. So when you do a save button on uh, uh, like your Word document or a PowerPoint or even in just whatever file, you're committing what's in memory to that specific file in there. So let's talk a little bit about like what the anatomy of a file is. Files come in all sorts of uh, sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, the, the purpose of every file though is to store data for later use. Um, most of the files we probably think about are, are common things like text files or JSON files. You might even think like a, a docx or a, you know, a pptx. Um, just uh, what about a, a PNGs or MP3s, right? Um, anything that's persistent is technically a file, even an executable. So like a .exe, that is just technically a file. And, and all of those are able to be operated and translated into machine code that then the processor uses to to work with them now every file has this kind of basic structure you have what is the header or the signature and that's kind of optional but most files will have some sort of header or signature to them um, and that's kind of to indicate what the file type is um, it's it's very dependent on on what that file type is um, that's in there you have the contents of it, which is the actual data that's going to be stored within that file. And then finally, you have this special character called the end of file. Um, and and it's, it's kind of this character that's indicated into there. Um, when we look at the files and we start um, uh, inspecting inside of the, the details of them, you actually won't see this character. Um, that is all handled actually at the operating system level. And so you don't have to worry about that. The only thing that you will have to worry about when we're starting working about it, um, working with files, is the header that's in there, if it's in there, and then its actual contents. And then that's the only thing that you really have to kind of worry about when we're working with files. Now, every file has a type associated with it. File types are typically designated by their file extension, such as like a .text or .csv, um, the .docx, uh, .docx, those types of things. But um, that is not always uh, the the case, meaning that I could take a .txt and change it to a .csv, and there's nothing stopping me from doing that on my computer. What happens, though, is when I load it up in a program, say I try to load it up into Excel and op open up that .txt that I changed now to a .csv, if it doesn't fit a specific format, it's going to break, and it's not going to work properly. So you kind of take on faith that the thing that you're passing in there is being processed by your programs um, you know, properly. 
And so that's why most files, if they have that extension, they will be working that way properly. Let's take a little bit of an example of the, the PNG or, or the portable network file format. Um, I'm going to click on this Wikipedia page here, and you can uh, see the link in, in the YouTube comments. Um, if we look at this, there's quite a bit of in here, but the thing that's really interesting is this file format in here. So the PNG is actually a really um, pretty easy to understand file format when you actually start looking into it. And the file header has this set of specific values. You have an 89, a 50, a 4E, a 47, a 0D, a 0A, a 1A, and then a 0A. And then an explanation of what each of those things are. Now, this is in hexadecimal format. So again, it's not talking about um, ones and zeros, but you can easily translate a hex into a binary system or binary value. So when we go back to this, what I have is this NASA logo that's right here. And you can see that when I do a hex dump or a look at the content contents of that on my computer, you can see those specific values. There's an 89, there's a 50, a 4E, a 47, a 0D, and then a 0A, a 1A, and then a 0A, just like what this said right here. You can see those specifically. So when you upload up a, a program, if it's really smart and it detects that that's a PNG and it doesn't see these contents in here, then it's going to see, then it's going to know, hey, this isn't properly formatted. And so I'm probably not looking at a PNG and I need to be kind of worried about that. Now, another interesting thing is um, docx. So like, let's look at the docx, right? A docx is actually um, a zipped file. So let's take this uh, file right here. So this is our, our syllabus, right? And I'm going to uh, do this. I'm going to make a copy of this and I'm going to paste it in here. And then I'm going to change the properties of this. So let's change the extension to a dot zip like this. We're going to say yes. And now it does this. This is the exact same file as this guy, right? And now if I open this up and extract this, into a folder, you can actually see that inside of this folder is a bunch of XML files that are in there. And so let's look at what some of these are. So let's look at the document.xml, right? And I'm going to open this up with our Visual Studio Code. And wow, that's a lot of stuff that's in there, right? How do we know what this even means? Well, if we go back and we look at what this uh, guy is supposed to look like, right? Let's kind of look for this. Let's look for this note right here. Um, let's say, let's search for this This syllabus is inside of this, this document. If you look at this, this XML almost looks like HTML. And that's because it kind of is like HTML. So let's see if we can find, hey, look, it's actually right here. This syllabus is subject to change throughout the semester. You can actually see that the contents are in there written in XML. And the way that Word, Word works is it wraps that up into all these XML documents and wraps them up as a zip file into a docx. And Word knows to look at it, extract it out, and then pull and parse up these, these different things. So not every file extension might be what you expect it to be. And that's just kind of an interesting way to look at at those different types of things. So another thing that's really important to files is understanding their file paths. A file path means literally a trail of how you get to that, that, that path um, or to that file. Just think of it like a, an actual trail path in real life. If you're traveling along a path and you want to get to a specific destination, you have to follow that path, right? Or that trail. Well, a file path is the steps that you must take to be able to get to that. And it's broken up into kind of three main components. You have the actual path to the folder, then the file name, and then finally the extension, right? And so the folder, um, the path itself is the folder tree or the, the folders that you have to navigate in order to get to that file. The file name, that's pretty self-explanatory. It's just the name of the file. And then finally, the file extension, and that is the dot whatever it may be. Um, and it's really important that that dot extension matches what the actual contents of that file is. 
Now, one big thing that you should note that if you're using Linux or Unix or Mac OS, you're going to be using backward slashes. Whereas if you're using Windows, then you're going to have a forward slash. So you need to be prepared um, for that in there. Now, let's talk about absolute versus relative paths. An absolute path is, um, the way that you can think about it is, is like if you're looking at a map, right? And you know um, from where the start point is to where the finish point is. And the start point is always the same for everybody. Now, the relative path, let's say that you've traveled along the path already for a little bit. You don't really care where you already started from. You care where you are right now. And how do you get from that current relative position to your destination? Well, an absolute path is exactly that. It's from the absolute start to the absolute end. A relative path is where are you currently and how do you get to your destination? That's the same thing with files, right? So a relative path is the file path in, that is in relation to your current working directory or where you currently are on that map. An absolute path is doesn't matter where you are. This is from the start point to the end point, how you get to that to that point. Now, the current working directory means our current location in which the system is currently working in. Um, so if you're working in a terminal and you've changed your directories into a bunch of different um, different directories, that is your current working directory. If you've loaded up a Python script, it is where that Python script was um, executed from. Um, not necessarily where the Python script is running or is actually located, but where you called that Python script, that's where your current working directory is. Um, here's an example of, of how we can use uh, relative paths and what it is. Um, so I've, I've got a file structure here, right? So this forward slash here is my my root folder. And then I've got a kind of different folders here. I've got a path and then two. And then I've got three different files inside of here, right? So I've got real life doodle.gif, tail darth plagueis.txt, and my pokedex.csv, right? How would we reference the file real life doodle.gif using absolute pathing? Well, that would be following the path that it takes to get to this file. So what would we need to do? Well, we would go from here to path to two, and then finally the real life doodle.gif. Let's look at the same um, folder structure and talk about our relative paths. So now we've changed our working directory. We're actually inside of two, but we want to reference real life doodle. How would we reference that as a path? Well, if we're already right here, then all we've got to do is just go to the folder or the file itself. So it's just going to be real life doodle.gif right there. That's all it is. That's the path that it takes to get to there. What if we wanted to reach tail Darth Plagueis? How would we do that using a relative path? Well, there's a special set of characters that you can implement called the double dot. And if you do a double dot with a forward slash, that what that does is that takes you back to one level of the folder. And then we would go from here and we can are now already inside of this. Now, if we were in path and we wanted to reference real life doodle, then we would only have to put two forward slash and then real life doodle. So when you're doing relative paths, it's always going to be where you're currently working and how to get there. And if you need to traverse backwards, if you're in the wrong folder, then you use the double dot with the forward slash to make the change. Okay. Now remember in Windows, it's going to be the opposite um, slash in there. So let's talk a little bit about line endings. And this is time for a history lesson. Um, this is really kind of a, a neat um, situation, uh, something that I did kind of like a, a little bit of research, not a lot. Um, but back in the Morse code days, uh, they they kind of had to determine a certain uh, set of characters to decide when there was going to be white space, right? So they had something for a space, they had something um, for a new line, they had obviously something for the end of transmission in there. Now, um, they it became really kind of apparent that they needed to use you know, the collection of characters. So they actually decided from what I could research that they did AA and that was a new line in there. Well, then as time kind of progressed, um, they wanted to have automatic um, 
uh, devices called teleprinters that when you did the Morse code would automatically translate that into there. And as time kind of went on, uh, these, these two different uh, organizations, so the ISO, the International Organization for Standards, and the ASA, the American Standards Association, which later became the ANSI, or the American National Standards Institute, came up with two different standards. ASA decided that the end of a line character meant that it was a carriage return combined with a line feed. Now, a carriage return means you're going to move the cursor back. So when you think about like a typewriter way back in the day, if you've ever seen a typewriter and you're typing, 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 and you get to the end of the line or the end of where you're done typing to go back to the beginning, you had to push that little lever in and it would go all the way back. And then a line feed was like that little enter button that then progressed it, the cursor to the next line. So you had a carriage return and then line feed. And that's how you went from where you were currently at to the next line all the way at the beginning. Um, in the ISO standard, however, you could either use a carriage return and line feed combined characters or just a line feed that was in there. Okay. So later as computers were started and adapted, they took those standards and adopted them into their MS-DOS, which was later used within Windows, used the CR CRLF uh, strict usage of the ANSI standard. And then other, um, on the other hand, Multics OS um, used just the LF character. Um, and then Multics would go on to kind of inspire Unix or Unix used the same things that uh, Multics was using. And, um, and then which in turn, Later, um, modern Mac OS used the same uh, type of thing. So why does this all matter? Well, Windows and Linux and Unix and Mac OS have different line endings. Okay, so Windows uses the um, CRLF or as represented in um, kind of the characters as a slash R slash N. Um, and then the Mac OS and Linux uh, characters is just a slash N that's in there. Why does this really matter? Well, because when you're working with files, if you have a slash R slash N or a slash N, just a slash N, um, then that's going to lead to some little kind of weird rendering issues. For a while, Windows actually broke if you had just a slash N because it actually wouldn't do the full um, uh, uh, line feed, right? So it just did, it actually, it just didn't fold it, do the new line. Um, and actually rendered it in there. Now that was a long time ago, and that doesn't uh, Windows automatically kind of detects and it knows. Okay, hey, yeah, hey, you've got some odd things, and it just deals with it anyways. Um, but in in Linux, you might have a, something similar. So let's look at this. So I've got a list here of just a, a bunch of different common uh, dog breeds that are out there. And in, if we created the file in Windows, you're going to see this slash r slash n, right? So the crlf um, that's in there. Now, if we render this or open this in a Unix or a Mac machine, we're going to see something like this. And it's going to take actually this CR and LF and render them as both new lines. So all of a sudden, you're going to see a bunch of new lines in between all that's in there, right? So between Pug and Jack Russell, there's actually two new lines. There's a space or a line in between these two values in there. So it's just really important to um, understand how the files that you're getting from, where the source, where they're coming from, and what their line endings are. And as you're processing things, if you're really, really dependent on that certain lines, um, maybe certain line numbers mean certain things, well, that may not be the case if you're transporting from Windows to Unix or from Unix to, to Windows as well. There may be some weird oddities there. So just need to be aware of that type of situation. Um, now, finally, let's talk about our, our character encodings. So character encodings is kind of another problem that you might face. Um, it, an encoding is essentially a translation from a number to a um, descriptive value. So when we talked about in the previous module using the ORD, right of a of a string of a character we're able to find out what the numerical value was in it into to python right well that's because there's an encoding to it right so two of the most common encodings are ascii and unicode and unicode actually has just a whole bunch of different versions that are inside of it as well um, 
the ASCII can only store up to 128 characters, while Unicode can contain up to 1,114,112 characters. Um, and that actually continues to change. So um, ASCII is actually a subset of Unicode um, or UTF-8. You can also see there's also UTF-16, and then I think there's even more and more and more. Um, so the kind of Unicode keeps changing, and basically what they're doing is they're adding more numbers to towards the end, and then those numbers have more translations to them. So um, one thing that you do need to be aware of, though, is if you create a file using a Unicode, um, like our UTF-8 encoding, and you try to parse it as an ASCII, um, there may be a situation where a character value that's beyond that 128 characters. So if you get something that's in the 256 range um, or higher or wherever, um, if it's beyond that 128, then it's going to be um, an error that you see in there. So that's not going to, to really um, work out in there. So you just need to be aware that when you um, are parsing files, that character encodings really matter. So make sure that you understand um, where the file is coming from and how it was encoded in there. Next up, what we're going to talk about is um, how uh, uh, how to work with Pathlib and uh, go over the basics of that.